This episode of The Prosecutors is brought to you by Huggies Little Movers. Get your baby's butt in a Huggies best fitting diaper. Huggies Little Movers, we got you, baby. I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Diptula. We're the host of the Strictly Stalking podcast. Strictly Stalking is a true crime podcast that explores stalking stories told by the survivors in their own words. Join us every Tuesday as we interview survivors, advocates, and experts to give you a deep dive into the workings of a stalking case. Would you know where to turn if you or someone you know is being stalked? We'll also give you the resources to fight back, know your rights, and get justice. Find Strictly Stalking wherever you listen to podcasts from Podcast One. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on the Prosecutors, an enticing job offer results in the disappearance of an entire family. Nearly 35 years later, there's still no trace of them. Where is the Jack family? Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my grateful co-host, Alice. Hey, Brett. We are in the month of gratefulness. I'm very grateful to be here with you and with so many of our patrons who are watching live because the chat, if you guys have not participated in one of these chats it is an episode of itself has nothing to do with what we're talking about and they have great discussions which i enjoy reading oh look ever since we started doing these recordings live with our patrons they really are amazing because we talk about the case i don't think anybody listening actually listens to anything we say nothing because if you watch their chat it's completely unrelated to what we're like not even true crime not about us nothing couldn't be more unrelated But I am so grateful for them. Gratitude is fantastic. We should practice it year round, not just during Thanksgiving. But have I told you about my son's obsession with the first Thanksgiving? You have not. (laughs) Can't wait to hear about it. So he's three and he's like, you know, when you learn things for the first time, he has learned about like the first Thanksgiving for the first time. I guess I didn't educate him at home. He didn't know about pilgrims. He didn't know about Native Americans. He didn't know about Squanto. Well, he really latched on to Squanto so much so that he's been running around the house for the last week shirtless with Mm. a shirt tied around his waist as a loincloth. And he's been asking for a wooden spoon to eat with because in one of his books that like the pilgrims and the Indians are eating with a wooden spoon. And so he's been eating with like my cooking spoon, which is, you know, half his size. So today I like found a wooden spoon. It was like at a little cute shop, right? It's not really for eating, but it's at least a normal size. So I bought him the wooden spoon thinking he'd be overjoyed. And I was like, man, I'm the best mom ever. I'm about to buy Squanto his wooden spoon. And he opened it and he was like, why does it look like a branch? And I was like, well, because it's a wooden spoon. So then he started eating with it and he goes, it tastes like wood. And then like threw it away. (laughs) I was so excited to buy this wooden spoon for him. So we're going to have to work with gratefulness for him. But I felt awesome for finding this cool wooden spoon, which I might have to post in like our Prasa Cookies group, the cookers, because it's a really cool spoon. I'm going to use it for like scooping spices or something Mm. well at least you'll get something out of it at least you appreciated it (laughs) alice i loved it i'm not gonna lie i did have i mean you know it's wood it tasted like that was kind of the point well (laughs) that is the last happy thought we're gonna have today yeah everybody cherish that i wanted to start something with good because we're obviously talking about kids today and i just get so sad when we talk about anything bad happening to kids Yes. You know, this won't be the the first time we've had tragedy befall a family, but we talked about the Jameson family. This is even more bizarre and even more tragic. We're talking about a family of four today, and we're returning to the Highway of Tears. Those of you who remember that episode, as we were going through it, there was a point where we talked about EPANA, Project EPANA, and we talked about sort of the criteria 
for that. And the criteria was pretty narrow. Had to be female, had to be engaged in some sort of risky behavior, disappeared in a certain area of the Highway of Tears. But we said there are other cases, too. And as we were going through them, we mentioned there was one case of the disappearance of the Jack family. And that was striking, that you would have an entire family disappear. And so we looked into it a little bit with the help of Madison, our awesome researcher, and decided we wanted to do an entire show on it. And I got to tell you, if you thought the Jameson family tragedy was bizarre and unusual, this one will blow you away. Because as little as we know about that case, we know worlds more than we know about what happened to the Jack family. And this is going to be another one of those episodes that's gonna probably going to make you a little mad because how it is possible for an entire family to disappear under the circumstances in which they disappeared and there be so little attention on it from the media, from the police, really from anybody, is mind-blowing. I know. I think that's absolutely right. Listen carefully to this story because this is not like other cases of missing people, missing families that we've covered. This family didn't vanish out of thin air. They were seen up until they vanished. That's the crazy part about this. They were seen and heard from and talked to multiple people as they were in the process of becoming disappeared, which is just mind boggling. And yet there are no clues. And we talked about how we kind of felt, I don't know if we, I felt like it was unlikely there was any kind of foul play in the Jameson family disappearance for all the reasons so rare to have someone target an entire family. Just, it seemed unlikely. In this case, it seems like that's exactly what happened. So let's dive into this case because I do want to cover the whole thing, hopefully in one episode. Before we get started, I do want to say, give a shout out to Real Horror on YouTube, which is a YouTube channel I discovered while researching this case. Awesome. Loved it. Going to be watching all their stuff. Really well done. And just great. So if you're looking for YouTube channels that cover true crime, do a really good job with it. Just some awesome visualizations. Like they put a lot of effort into it. Really good. So I hope you'll check it out. The episode on the Jack family is called The Family That Vanished. So Ronnie and Doreen Jack were both born in 1963 on the Cheslata Reserve, which is a small village in rural British Columbia, Canada. From the start, life was a challenge for both of them. They were both First Nations members and were faced with many of the same issues that swept First Nations communities at the time. And you've all heard of those problems, alcoholism, unemployment, poverty, and efforts to, I don't know exactly how you would describe it, but to separate people in First Nations from their culture and sort of assimilate them into Canadian culture. This is something that happened a lot going into the 70s in Canada, and this was something they were experiencing as well, and it was something that led to a lot of generational trauma, which you're going to see as we talk about this. Ronnie Jack had always been characterized as a complicated individual. He grew up as one of six boys. He loved the outdoors, hunting, and valued hard work. He also loved music and dancing. And he was outwardly a friendly guy, but he struggled to control his emotions at times, and he was prone to anger and violence. And he was extremely close with his mom and maintained this bond throughout his whole life. Doreen Jack's life was tragic from the very beginning. She was one of three girls who were raised by a single father after their mother abandoned the family. Her father was an abusive alcoholic who subjected his daughters to physical, mental, and sexual abuse. He reportedly would drunkenly shoot at the girls and force them to sleep outside in the cold. He would also allow his friends to sexually abuse the girls. So, a horrific way to grow up, and unfortunately, as we said, not unusual at this time for a lot of people. A lot of trauma that followed these folks for their whole lives. The sisters were ultimately removed from the home, and you would think, oh, that's good. They were removed from the home, but they were enrolled in the Lejac Residential School, and life there was no better. The girls continued to face physical and verbal abuse from the nuns running the school. The school closed in 1976, and the girls were shuffled around for a while. Doreen ended up in a Catholic high school where she met Ronnie, but sadly, trauma seemed to follow her. It was here that Doreen was raped by a fellow classmate and became pregnant with her first child at only 17 years old. Russell Jack was born on February 25, 1980. 
80. Oh, it's already filled with so much sadness and we haven't even gotten to our story. And what really strikes me, especially with Doreen's story, is just that they're so young, right? If you're following this, they're born in, what, 1963, and they're going to disappear by 1989 at 26 years old. But before 26, before really even 18 years old, Doreen has lived a lifetime of abuse at the hands of men. Her own father, her mother left her, which is tragic, you know, in and of itself. But then to be molested and abused in every way that you can be abused by the one remaining parent you have, and then to be kind of ripped from your family, even if it was a horrific family life situation, only to be dealt even more abuse at the hands of strangers and those who are supposed to care for you once you've been removed from an abusive household. You know, you may think you know where the story is going, but it's not quite like that because Doreen and Ronnie wanted to make something different for their life. They didn't want to perpetuate, you know, what they had endured. So a couple years later in 1982, you know, Doreen was a young teen mother, but she and Ronnie reconnected and they started a relationship. Doreen and Russell, her son, moved in with Ronnie at his mother's house. And by all accounts, the couple were happy in their relationship and thrilled when they welcomed a son of their own. Ryan, who was born on July 26th, 1985. So this young couple is a blended family with Russell, who's five at the time that their son Ryan is born. So two boys, two young people living with Ronnie's mom. But unfortunately, this happiness was short-lived and the couple's relationship began to crumble. You can imagine a lot of baggage coming in. They're young. They're not you know, financially independent. They're having to depend on Ronnie's mom for really their entire livelihood so far. And not to mention throwing in two young kids into the mix often adds a lot of stress as well. And unfortunately, Ronnie too became physically abusive with Doreen. And to cope, Doreen began to drink heavily. At the same time, the couple started facing really significant financial troubles when Ronnie, the provider for the family, injured his back and he was no longer able to continue his work at the sawmill, which is a very physical job. In the late 80s, the family decided to move to Prince George. And though this was a rough area, it was known to be a hot spot for jobs in the timber industry and Ronnie really needed to work to support his family. But unfortunately, even after the move, Ronnie struggled to find steady work and the Jack family ended up on welfare assistance with worse financial struggles than ever. And Ronnie's mother, Mabel, reported that Ronnie had told her he owed someone money, but the amount and to whom are not clear. So that's all we really know. We're not sure even how that factors into what's about to happen, but you know, kind of hindsight, you try to latch onto anything that may provide you answers for what's about to happen. I think it's important to know this family's in desperate straits. And when people are desperate, they occasionally will believe things that they shouldn't believe. And they'll ignore the red flags that are flapping in the breeze. And you're going to see those as we get into what happened to this family. And this takes us to August 1st, 1989. So Ronnie Jack, he goes out to grab a beer at the first leader pub in Prince George, British Columbia. This was known as a seedy place, but it was only four blocks away from Ronnie's home. And it was the only place for him to grab a drink. Now, while he's there, he starts talking with a man. And this man turns out to be a bit of a godsend for Ronnie. He offers him an incredible job opportunity that would significantly change the Jack family's circumstances. According to this man... There was a logging ranch in the lake area where Ronnie could have a job bucking logs, which is basically when you take, cut down a tree and you break it up into the various parts that you're going to sell it as. And Doreen could also work as a cook's helper in the camp kitchen. Now, Ronnie said, that's great, but you know we have two kids. I'm not sure what we would do with them. Well... The man had an answer for that as well. The ranch even had daycare for the couple's two children. Now, this was unbelievable. An awesome job offer that seemed to take care of all of their problems. Jobs for both of them, daycare for the kids. And Ronnie was in a position where this was sort of an offer he could not say no to. 
This was an offer that he felt like he basically had to take, and he was happy to do it. The only problem was the ranch was about 40 kilometers, which for those of us in God's country, is about 25 miles away from their home in Prince George, and the family didn't have a car. But once again, this angel from on high says, no problem, we'll take my truck. You can load up your stuff in my truck, and I will drive you to this logging camp where all of your dreams will come true, essentially. So around 11 p.m. that night, Ronnie and this unknown man who is giving him the opportunity of a lifetime who could probably you know, pull them out of these dire financial straits and maybe finally turn their life around, they were reportedly seen leaving the pub together. And this man would later be described by witnesses as a Caucasian male between 35 and 40 years old and between six feet and six, six. So pretty tall and somewhere around 200 to 275 pounds with reddish brown hair and a mustache. And his hair was down to his ears and was parted on one side. He was reported to be wearing a baseball cap, a red checkered work shirt faded blue jeans, a blue jacket, and work boots. One thing I want to note how wide-ranging the metrics of the man is. And this just shows you we always talk about direct versus circumstantial evidence. This is from direct, you know, witnesses of people who saw this person. And the best they could do was give you basically like six to six and a half feet, 200 to 275 pounds, which is a pretty big range. Generally, I think the only thing you can really draw from that is he's a big guy. Yeah. And let me say this. It's interesting because obviously the Jack family or First Nations, this is an area, as we talked about when we talked about the Highway of Tears with a lot of indigenous people, this guy would have stood out because he's a big dude. <laughs> as you said, can't say exactly how tall he is. But he's tall and he's big and he's got, you know, red hair and the red beard or whatever. And you would think he would stick out a little bit. You know, you wouldn't think you'd see as many people who look like this guy hanging out in this pub. And in particular, you know, we know, again, that Ronnie is First Nation and you can see a picture of him. He has dark, you know, black hair brown eyes, much smaller than six and a half feet tall. And so if you were to see them in a pub, I can see that standing out as well because they look so different from each other, even just by height. Like I am far from six and a half feet tall. When I talk to someone who is much taller than me, like it's a little weird because like someone needs to bend down or I need to, you know, I don't know, stand on my tippy toes. I say that because it's almost a saving grace that he stood out so much. Otherwise, we wouldn't even have this description of him. I think the only reason people were able to come forward with this description of him is because he stood out in this kind of rough area of Prince George by being such a big white guy. And let me also say this. I think it's pretty evident that whoever this guy was, he actually probably did know something about the logging industry. He's able to converse intelligently about it in a way that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be able to do. Doesn't necessarily mean he worked in it, but he knew enough about it that he could have this conversation with Ronnie. And Ronnie thinks this all makes sense. This all sounds legit. This sounds like something that this guy, you know, he's not just blowing smoke. And that's a great point, because while we know Ronnie worked at a sawmill and, you know, he has knowledge of this, generally this guy, if he ends up having done something bad, he is in an area that is known for being a hot spot for timber jobs specifically. So in other words, you're likely going to find people in this area who are very well versed in the timber industry. And if you yourself are not well versed in it, I think people would be able to sniff it out pretty quickly. So he doesn't know Ronnie's level of sophistication in the timber world, but we know that they didn't meet up. They didn't plan to meet there. They randomly met and struck up a conversation. And the odds of this guy speaking to someone at a pub in the middle of a hot spot for timber industry is just likely going to be speaking with someone who really knows the timber industry. All this means is this guy probably knew something or at least knew enough to be able to pass in an area where you'd expect everyone to be able to sniff out someone who doesn't really know the industry. At 11.16 p.m., Ronnie calls one of his brothers, remember he's one of six brothers, he's close to his family, to tell him about this amazing job 
offer. And one source reported that he asked his brother if the kids could actually stay with him while he and Doreen went to the ranch. But for reasons that were not known right now, that wasn't possible. If only they were able to leave their kids behind. But you'll see that, you know, supposedly people saw Ronnie leave with this guy. So it seems like they're probably together right now. And he's actually calling someone to tell him about this great job with the man who just gave him the job offer. And even though he knows there's daycare, he's trying to leave his kids behind. You can imagine why. You're probably going to be working long hours, probably a long drive. A lot of people go off, make some money, come back to their kids. And at some point later that night, Doreen's sister, Laureen, actually stopped by the Jack's house to ask if Doreen could watch her kids that week. But when Laureen arrived, she saw Ronnie and Doreen packing a pickup truck with some of their belongings. She knew that wasn't their truck because they didn't have a car. And instead of saying anything, Laureen decided it was just best not to bother them about her child care request because they were clearly packing up to go somewhere. Again, in the span of like an hour of getting this great job offer, Members of both sides of the family, both Doreen's side of the family and Ronnie's family, is getting clued in that something's happening. This isn't a situation where they leave in the dark of night and no one knows what's happening. Alice, I am so glad that First Leaf is a part of this podcast because I'm not sure that I would be able to find wine without them. This probably comes as a surprise to none of you, but I'm not exactly a wine expert. And being in the grocery stores... During the holidays is like being stuck in a maze. And don't get me started on the wine aisle between the people crowding, the giant selection, and the fact that I don't know anything that I'm doing. I always end up grabbing the same bottle and running to the checkout. But with First Leaf, they take the stress out of finding new wine. First Leaf is the wine club that sends me a personalized shipment of bottles that are based on my unique palate right to my door. All I have to do is go to First Leaf's website, answer a few questions about my likes and dislikes, and their expert team will select a customized assortment of world-class wines based on my preferences. And after I've tried each wine, I can rate them so that First Leaf can send me more wines based on my feedback. It's also crazy how many new types of wines I have been trying and loving thanks to First Leaf. Brett, it's so right. I love First Leaf because they also make it super easy to get personalized wine boxes delivered on my schedule right to my door. And since I choose the day of my shipment, I'm never stressing about missing a delivery. Plus, all First Leaf wine is priced 30% lower than what you'd pay at a wine store. And every selection is backed by First Leaf's 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Find the wine you'll love this holiday season with First Leaf. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash prosecute to sign up and you'll get your first six hand curated bottles for just $44.95. That's T-R-Y-F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F.com slash prosecute. Tryfirstleaf.com slash prosecute. Brett, have you ever been on the hunt for a new doctor and you ask literally everyone you know for their recommendation? You know, a doctor who actually gets you, listens to you, and makes you feel super comfortable? And finally, after weeks of searching, you find the one. This is the perfect doctor for you. So you call their office and they have an appointment available. Yes. But then the receptionist tells you this perfect doctor doesn't take your insurance. Wipe your tears, put away the ice cream, and head over to ZocDoc to find and book the doctor who's right for you and takes your insurance. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. Alice, I'm not getting any younger, and I decided I needed a doctor. I used ZocDoc, and I was amazed at how easy it was to narrow down the physicians in your area that take your insurance and are open for new patients. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to the doctor tomorrow for the first time in a decade. The great thing about ZocDoc, all the doctors have verified reviews from actual real patients, not bots. And the average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 and 48 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. 
What are you waiting for? Go to ZocDoc.com slash prosecutors and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash prosecutors. ZocDoc.com slash prosecutors. So at around midnight, Doreen's cousin arrives at the property. Now, we don't actually know why he stopped by, but he would later be the person to give the description of the unknown man to investigators and confirm what time the Jack family left the residence. So good thing he stopped by because he's the one who actually gives that description that we gave you earlier. At about 1.15, Ronnie calls his parents to tell them about the job. Now, this is 1.15 a.m., by the way. He explains to them that the whole family is going to go and they would be gone for around 10 to 14 days, but they would definitely be home in time for Russell to start school in the fall. So basically, this is kind of a, you know, we're going to do an August job, make some money, come back so the kids can start school. Now, Ronnie's final words to his mother are haunting and have hung over this case since he said them and clue you in that maybe he knew this job it might be too good to be true. He said, Mom, if I don't come back, come looking for me. Combine that with the fact that he was trying to find a place for the kids, and it makes you wonder if he really did have some doubts. He really kind of wanted to leave the kids behind, just in case. I'm sure he probably told himself, I'm overthinking this, but Mom, if I don't come back, come looking for me. You know what's really interesting is, no, this is all happening pretty late at night. This is happening between the hours of like 11.15 and 1.30 in the morning. A lot of their family seems to be up and about. But one thing that strikes me in all of these conversations and all these interactions is maybe they had the conversation, but it's not reported, is no one said, why can't you leave in the morning, right? Like this job offer came at like 11 p.m. Likely any sort of mill, any sort of ranch is going to be closed that late at night. And if anything, they would start work at dawn when there's light because you're going to be working out in the field. You're not working in a factory where there are lights and you're working all night, right? You're likely going to start maybe right at the break of dawn. So it's August. Maybe they start at 5 a.m. So why not spend a good night at home, sleep, and then go out? And, you know, if only they had done that. But clearly there is an urgency to all this. And it may be as simple as the man said, I can only take you now. And they don't have a car and they're not in a position to bargain. Yeah. And this is, I mean, it's, there, there are red flags. And we're going to talk about some more of those. But it, this is, it's a job that's too good to be true and one that you have to take at one o'clock in the morning. At one twenty-one a.m., the Jack family is seen by that cousin leaving their home and getting into a dark colored pickup truck. They are never seen again. On August 25th, 1989, Mabel Jack, Ronnie's mom, reports the whole Jack family missing to the RCMP. And note, this is 23 days, more than three weeks after they were last heard from. Now, within a couple of days, the RCMP discovered several alarming details related to this disappearance. They searched the Jack family home and they found that they didn't take more than a couple's week worth of clothing, but it's been more than three weeks since they've been gone. They also spoke to logging camps in the general area and confirmed that none of them were hiring at the time. And maybe most eerily of all, the RCMP discovered that no logging camps in Canada permitted children on site for various health and safety reasons. There were absolutely no camps in Canada with daycares. And you've got to believe that Ronnie knew this because Ronnie worked in the industry. You know, you may not know about the regulations in Canada generally, but if you had known of a daycare, especially if you have children of your own, you probably would have heard of it. It probably would have been a primo spot, right? Got to get into X, Y, and Z camp because they actually have childcare and I don't have to worry about that since I have young kids at home. And so again, this may have been one of those he just knew in his gut because he's been working at these camps before and never seen daycares, never seen other kids hanging around. But here this guy is saying, no, bring your kids along. Don't you worry about it. And all of you listening may think, wow, a lot of red flags. There were red flags the night of. 
okay, maybe it was still a great situation. Maybe they went to go work, but it was supposed to be for 10 to 14 days. Now, 23 days later, we haven't heard from them. This is all very suspect. Even more suspect, the RCMP finds a lot of strange evidence. But even with this evidence, the RCMP didn't immediately suspect foul play, despite all of the information we just told you. At some point, they even put out a statement that said, quote, it was possible he found further employment and hasn't bothered to phone home. Where does that even come from? What they know is this guy is close to his family, so close, in fact, that the night he gets the offer and has to leave, he calls his mom and his brother around midnight, later than midnight, in order to tell them what's going on. And yet he doesn't phone home. And that's certainly not what Mabel thinks. Otherwise, Mabel wouldn't have reported them missing. I mean, this is where the fury starts to burn because any outsider, any one of us looking at this can clearly see something is not right for the Jack family. And it's not just one person. It's not just Ronnie who's off and not phoning home, even though he found further work. Doreen didn't phone anybody. She's close to her family. She, you know, had spoken to and just seen her sister. We don't have the kids. You know, Russell was supposed to start school. He's nine years old. He hasn't started school. And this is just shocking, the amount of just not caring, it seems. No news media, no kind of let's get a search party together. Just a probably didn't call. And they did not assign this case as, quote, foul play suspected. So when it's not categorized as foul play... It's really not taken seriously. And we've seen this again and again in so many of these cases where police, investigators, whoever, just ignore obvious signs that there's a problem. And I don't know why they do it. I don't know if it's they're overworked and they're busy or it's tunnel vision or it's just willful blindness. They don't want to think it's foul play because then they're going to have to put the extra work into it. I don't know if it was just they couldn't imagine that an entire family would be abducted. I mean, however you want to describe this. But we see it again and again, and it often leads to the cases that we talk about. Because as we've said, when the police don't take it seriously in the beginning, oftentimes by the time they do, critical time is lost, critical evidence is lost, and they're never going to solve the case. In this case, unfortunately, it's just like a cavalcade of failures that's going to continue. This is just the first example of everything that's going wrong. And look, as Alice said, I think it probably is true that Ronnie in the back of his mind knew that this whole idea of bringing your kids to logging camp didn't sound right. And I think it's just important to remember what desperation can do to people and how desperate these folks were. And they had in their mind two warring parties one of them was saying this is too good to be true the other one was saying yeah that's why i can't turn it down i have to take it and and we talk about this sometimes in terms of that whole gift of fear thing we've talked about before where listening to the little voice in your head happens in all sorts of circumstances these people were in a particularly bad place because this wasn't just that guy seems sketchy i don't want to be alone with him it was I need to feed my family, and this person is offering me a lifeline. How can I possibly turn them down? And then the case ends up the way it does. So with RCMP, they are slow to act. By August 29th, though, there is an alert issued in the Nanomi Daily Free Press that read, Ron and Doreen Jack, Burns Lake, BC, call Mabel Jack. And you can imagine this is almost like a like a classified ad for if you have any information about this call Mabel and I bet this was probably something that she put out on her own and it was probably all she could afford unfortunately the paper that ran the alert was 10 hours away from where the Jack family went missing so it wasn't a very effective measure and it was highly unlikely to reach anyone who actually would have information about them on August 30th 1989 a better thing happens or it seems like but it's going to turn really bad The Prince George Citizen runs a story about the missing family, but they actually end up getting a lot of the details wrong in such a way that would be misleading to anyone who was trying to find the Jack family. But it gets even worse. The same paper would mistakenly report a week later that the Jack family had actually been located. This, of course, was not true, and it's unclear how this happened, but it's basically been chalked up to a miscommunication. 
This was actually the extent of the media coverage surrounding the Jack family disappearance in the immediate aftermath of that disappearance. And this misinformation that they had been found will end up having extremely negative consequences. I mean, how do you have a miscommunication like that? It's not like if you get no communication about something, you're automatically like, well, if I didn't hear from these missing people, must have been found. I mean, it sounds so pernicious as if certainly there must have been some sort of moving actor to cause the misinformation because you and I have dealt with files all the time that sit on our desk for weeks, months, years even where we get no additional leads. We don't know what's going to happen. We're not even the media. We're investigators or we're working with the investigators in order to prosecute cases where when there's no new information, unless there's new evidence found or someone calls in with a tip. That folder sits there, but I wouldn't pick up a file where nothing had happened in the case and decide kind of the opposite had been resolved without some movement, someone coming to me to say it had been resolved. And you can't chalk it up to them hearing it in the news reported by somebody else because they're the only ones reporting on this. I don't know how other media outlets didn't catch on to this, period. If this family had been located and they'd been missing for a month, I would think that's a great human interest story, right? We see this all the time. Child lost in the woods for seven days, survives with dog, found unharmed. Man, they appear on like daytime talk shows and we want to hear how did you survive with your dog for seven days? You know, when did you hear the rescuers and, you know, feel good, great story. Nothing on either side, not reporting the disappearance of an entire family with young children, nor reporting on the miraculous you know, finding of a family after they've been missing for a month. All of this just smells of such uncaring, right? And we've said this before. It might be because of the fact that they're First Nation people. Maybe it's just that there was too much news at this time. But I would say that on its face, it would be an interesting story either way, whether they disappeared or were found. Yet we see no reporting and also nothing by the RCMP to find out what happened. So the fall of 1989, family members really weren't getting any updates. So they called the RCMP to get an update on the case. And to their shock, they discovered that the RCMP had actually closed the case because they were under the impression the family had been found. I suppose the impression was through the media again. Investigators, the ones we work with, don't rely on the media for their updates in cases. If we saw an update on a case, which does happen, we then go follow up. We go interview the family. We, at the very least, call the person who called in the people missing. Mabel, is it true? They've been found. What great news. Wonderful. I'm glad this is a happy ending. Then we close the case. We don't like troll the 10 o'clock news every night to check off cases based on what the media has reported. And this is, unfortunately, it's one of those cases that it's only been covered in a few places. I feel like there's a lot of missing information. The police obviously didn't do a great job with it. Neither did the media. So it's really kind of hard to figure out exactly what was happening around this time. But it seems like one of two things happened. Either whoever it was who told the newspaper that the Jack family had been found also told the RCMP that. Or the RCMP saw it in the paper and was like, oh, great, they've been found and closed the case. I feel like the second one is not likely. I would like to think that the RCMP didn't close the case based on an article in the newspaper, which seems to mean that they communicated with somebody. They communicated with somebody who said, update, want to let you guys know the Jack family's been found. That makes you wonder, who was that person? Could that be the person who's responsible for their disappearance? Could that person have seen this newspaper article and kind of got spooked and so calls the newspaper office says oh no they found him calls the rcmp says the same thing i mean that would be the kind of information i would think if you're the police you'd want to follow up on exactly how did that misinformation come into the public record because that could be something that's absolutely critical to figuring out what actually happened to them it doesn't seem like any of that investigation was actually done I mean, at the very least, you take down the name of the person who reports they're found. You can imagine someone pretending and not being the Jack family, but calling and say, I'm calling about my brother. He was one of six boys. You know, my brother's been found. It was a misunderstanding. We're good. At the very least, there would be a police report with that person's name, where they're calling from, and 
if you weren't going to follow up with the actual Jack family, the very least is at least to know who called that in, which I think that's right, Brett. You know, that's what I was trying to get at with the news article. Seems like there was a mover who was spouting off false information. And to their to those that person's chagrin, everyone just bought it, you know, lock, stock and barrel without even questioning it. So the RCMP had to reopen the case at this point because despite their, quote, under the impression the family had been found, they were now hearing from the family that no, the Jack family had not been found. So up to this point, there wasn't even a case open. And when it was open, remember, there wasn't even a classification that foul play was suspected. Now, maybe something's going to be done, but yet months go by before something happens in the case. Finally, on December 19th, 1989, a composite drawing of the man the family was seen leaving with is released. And like most composite drawings, there's going to be like multiple versions because it's going to be someone drawing it as people are describing it to them. And it's hard to recreate what's in someone else's mind. You can look at these composite drawings and it generally looks like a white guy, right? Who's like youngish, not too old, not too young. And that's basically what I get from it. Again, it's in stark comparison to Ronnie and the rest of the family who don't look white. They look like they have darker skin and darker hair and darker features in general. I would say at the very least, this composite just looks like kind of the polar opposite of how you would describe the Jack family. Yeah. I mean, you know, I look at this guy and I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what I think. Like he's the eyes. I mean, it's, you know, it's funny because it's a sketch. So, you know. It could just be the way the artist did it. The eyes are really freaky. Like he has some freaky eyes. <laughs> and the and the thing is, both sketches, which I assume these sketches both come from the same eyewitness. I mean, maybe they found some people in the pub, but it's interesting. You know, he has very full hair in in kind of well kept hair in one of the one of the composite sketches. And we'll obviously put this on the website. And if you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing it now. And then the other one, though. His hair is not as full. It's more stringy. He looks a little rougher to me. He looks older to me in the second one. I don't know. They clearly, you know, they're much closer than, say, the Delphi sketches. Right? The Delphi they clearly sketches. Look, they could be the same person, but same just person. described from different angles with people. But I agree with you, especially in the first sketch, the kind of shorter hair sketch. The eyes are much darker. It looks like there's like deep shadows under his eyes. But that might be... Because they're in a pub where lighting is not. We don't know exactly who the witness or witnesses were who contributed to the sketch. But the places that he was seen were going to be outside, close to midnight, next to a pickup truck. Probably not stadium lights on. In a pub, again, where usually the lights are not on. It's going to be mood lighting in a pub. So in general, I think... You have to take, a, you know, these sketches with a grain of salt because I don't think there was good lighting to be able to capture exactly what the hair looked like, except that I think it's fair to say this person had a lot of hair on his head and in his beard and mustache. I mean, look, I think this guy probably looked like somebody who worked in the lumber industry. You know, if you just imagine sort of a lumberjack, <laughs> your stereotypical view of a lumberjack, somebody in the chat said they were kidnapped by Paul Bunyan. And that is kind of how he's described. It's like he's Paul Bunyan and he kind of looks like Paul Bunyan, you know, and he's got his like Carhartt jacket on or whatever. And it's talking shop. And I mean, he looks like he's he could have been out in the wilderness. So he definitely pulls it off. But I don't know. I can see how this sketch maybe wasn't that helpful in generating leads. And also, it's like four months later, right? And so they likely sketched this in December, meaning the people who are giving the information about the sketch are trying to remember someone they saw f one night four months ago. But in 
we talked about having the two sketches. So there's one sketch that comes out in December of 1989, then February of 1990. So a couple months later, missing posters are created. I don't know why it took two months to create missing posters when it seems clear that the Jack family is missing and there's at least someone they think is connected to their disappearance. But nevertheless, two months later, they get missing posters made and a $2,000 reward is offered for information relating to the whereabouts of the Jack family. June 6, 1990. So six months after the first sketch, a second sketch of the unknown man was released. And that's the, the kind of lighter sketch that you see if you're watching YouTube. And over the years, Mabel, Ronnie's mom, has just worked tirelessly to try and keep the Jack family's story in the media. But what little coverage it did receive seemed to dwindle throughout the mid-90s. So she, you know, like any mother who is is just missing her son, wants someone to pay attention. But somehow this story catches no media's attention. Pre-podcast days, I'd like to say. I would like to think if something like this happened today, it would be blasted far and wide. You know, I'd like to think that if there's one benefit from our 24-hour news cycle and Twitter and all the podcasts and Court TV and everybody else, that this is this could not happen today. I, unfortunately, that's probably not true. <laughs> it probably could happen. It's like we've talked about before. There, there are always certain groups of people that, for whatever reason, the media and everybody else just doesn't focus on. And this family, I think, there were a couple things going against them. Number one, you didn't have that kind of media saturation. Number two, this is happening in a relatively rural area. Number three, it's happening in an area that has a ton of disappearances. So you could imagine it kind of fell through the cracks a little bit. And then, obviously, you know they are an indigenous family and I just feel like there just wasn't as much. It just seems like the RCMP, they probably, you want to know what they probably thought. They probably thought, look, you know, these people, those people, they're always moving around. It's not like they put down roots. Okay. Whatever they've, you know, they moved to the next logging camp down the road. They'll be back. Why are you bothering us? You know, let us deal with the real problems, right? That is what they were thinking when they that got is, this call. That is what they're thinking. And just to show how flawed it is, they know this family doesn't have a car. And these camps, we're not talking about like, you know, this is some small, cute town where you can walk from store to store. Timber, you need land, a lot of land. There's a lot of land in between these camps. You need to somehow be able to get from camp to camp if, in fact, the RCMP's theory is correct that Ronnie found a new job and forgot to phone home. Well, you would think someone would remember hitchhiking, helping pick up hitchhikers of a family of four. And someone else has to be involved in order to move them because they can't move themselves since they have no car. So the problem is you've already put more thought into this than they did. Like They didn't even think about it for that long. I mean, I don't look. It is certainly possible it's just sort of a range of things when you're trying to figure out why people did the things they they did. People always accuse us of speculating about things, and we do, because we try and figure out this stuff. Like, we, like I actually would like to know what was going on. And I think one possibility, and it's a real possibility, is just the people who took the reports did not care. That they just were like, honestly, not even worth my time for these people. I don't care about those people. Forget it. The other possibility is it wasn't quite that bad, but it was sort of what I was describing, just sort of like an innate discrimination against these people and an assumption that these kind of people, of course, they're going to disappear. If I you know, wasted my time with every time somebody from one of these reservations or, or reserves disappeared, I'd be wasting all my time, right? And then just... Maybe you had a situation where you didn't have that many officers in the area and they were a little overwhelmed and maybe you can give them a little bit more grace. Unfortunately, I think it's probably more likely one of the first two things. I think just it just no one. And we talk about this sometimes. You know, it takes work to actually follow up on these things. It takes going out and looking for people. It takes paperwork. It takes organizing searches. And sometimes I just think people, they just, they're in these situations, they just, they don't care enough to even do that basic minimum level of work 
that would have that they should have done. Just the minimum level, the bare minimum. The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey guys, whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with progressive insurance. Quote today at progressive.com to try the name your price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust progressive progressive casualty insurance company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. This episode of The Prosecutors is brought to you by Huggies Little Movers. Huggy knows that babies come in all shapes and sizes, and their tushies do too. Huggies' best-fitting diaper is their Little Movers with its curved and stretchy fit. Moms know that there's nothing worse than an ill-fitting diaper, especially for your active babies. I love Huggies because I can rely on them to keep my baby covered while she moves around. You guys have been with me as baby brettany has been born, and now she is starting to crawl. And I just love these Huggies because they keep everything contained, but they also allow her to be the active baby she is. Guys, we are covered up with babies on this podcast, and we're so glad to have Huggies. I don't know what we would do without them. Huggies Little Movers are curved, so my babies feel comfy no matter how much they're moving around. And they are moving around a lot. They also offer up to 12-hour protection against leaks, which is a game changer. Get your baby's butt into Huggies Best Fitting Diaper. Huggies Little Movers. We got you, baby. I mean, like, look, it took them two months after they had a sketch to make a missing poster. You know how you make a missing poster? That sketch you just pushed out, you literally just write on top of it, Jack family missing. Info, phone number, right? Like something that an intern could make. It took them two months to get around to doing. And it is sad because, you know, <laughs> Brett and I have this conversation all the time, how the worst traits about each of us is that we're, we work too much. <laughs> like We don't know how to say no. And we regularly work way more than is healthy <laughs> for our families or for ourselves. And that's because I can't see something that I can make a difference in, in my cases, in my work, and go to bed that night without having done it. And that's just it's just how I'm wired. And so to think that someone can like go to sleep and wake up two months in a row and be like, you know, what? I should really make that missing poster and go to sleep like, what, 60 days in a row? And then finally on the 61st day, be like, you know what, I'm finally going to finally going to make that poster is not something that even begins to comport with how I'm wired. Yeah. And, you know, we always try and give police the benefit of the doubt because we work with them and we know sort of the things that can happen we know the things that go on behind the scenes. We know some of the stuff that other people either don't know or ignore. But that doesn't mean that police are above criticism. Of course they're not. And they do bad things. And they do things that are wrong. And this is a case where the way it was handled from the very beginning is just disgraceful. And the fact, and once again, the fact that the RCMP, with everything they knew, decided to to drop the investigation because they had been found without any follow-up on why they thought that. <laughs> it's just further evidence that this was just, it was a case that just didn't matter to anybody. And I think eventually the RCMP, they started working this case. They did do the sketches. They did try and, but by that point, it'd been months. Months had passed. I mean, to give you kind of, again, well, <laughs> we thought we'd cover this in one episode, Brett. Ha <laughs> ha, we're so silly. But you know what? The fact that the Jack family got so little media coverage for so long, the least we can do is do two episodes, you know? And so I'm fine with how much we're talking about this because none of this was talked about at the time or in the years following their disappearance. And maybe there's still hope. There are still people who are alive who might know something. But just to give you an idea that we're not making up things that the, the police should have done and didn't. 
I I dealt with a lot of kidnapping cases. I would get called in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., when there was a child being kidnapped and they were actively tracking them, trying to figure out where they were. Thankfully, in most of these situations, the child was ultimately found. I was involved before the child was found in most of these situations because they needed warrants, pings, cell phones, whatever, right? So I'm involved. I'm not out there looking for the child, but I'm actively involved in the investigation as it's one of those emergent situations where you get an Amber Alert on your phone. It's blaring. People are looking for the white pickup truck with, you know, a Connecticut license plate. In those situations, when we find the child and usually the adult that they are with, there is a flurry of activity to ensure that the case is wrapped up. It's not like we find the child and we're like, go home, everybody. It's 4 a.m. Go to sleep. Way to go. Another night of jobs. Well done. No, no, no. We are then interviewing like every single witness along the way. Wonderful that they're now found, but we interview everyone, including the victim, their parents, the gas station clerk who saw them. We go get the security cameras from every location that we knew they were. We, you know, dot all our I's, cross all our T's and make sure we have all that evidence that we were flying off the shelves getting in order to find the child. That continues. And the case continues and that case file continues for days after to wrap it up. There is no situation where a child who we thought was found wasn't actually found because investigators would have laid eyes on them. They would have been interviewed. They would have been given like victim services. And so we're not just making this up that there's more the police should have done. There is so much more that they should have done if they actually thought the Jack family had been found because there were kids involved. You would think at the very least victim advocates for these children would have interviewed them and questioned if the children were in harm's way by their own parents because they were supposed to start school, were they fed during this month, what was going on, no follow-up whatsoever. And that is an anomaly in a case like this. Well, as Alice said, we're going to end up doing two episodes on this. I do want to say, just if you're listening, I want to give you sort of the general description of both the Jack family and the person who may be responsible for this in case you are someone out there who has some information. I mean, this is as a child of the eighties, I would like to think the eighties weren't that long ago. So Ronald Paul Jack, he was 26 at the time of his disappearance. He was five feet, six inches tall and weighed about 150 pounds. He is indigenous and has black hair and brown eyes. Doreen Ann Jack was also 26. She was five feet two and weighed about 110 pounds. She also has black hair and brown eyes. Russell Fabian Jack was nine years old at the time of his disappearance. He was four feet tall and weighed 88 pounds. He also had black hair and brown eyes. Ryan Paul Jack was four years old at the time of his disappearance. He was three foot, three inches tall and 55 pounds and also with black hair and brown eyes. The man was described as a Caucasian male, 35 to 40 years old, 183 centimeters to 198 centimeters. I don't know why we have centimeters on him, but not everybody else. But anyways, which is six feet, six inches tall, 200 to 275 pounds or 91 to 125 kilograms, reddish brown hair with a full beard, wearing a ball cap, red checkered work shirt, faded blue jeans, blue nylon jacket, and work boots with leather fringes over the toes if you have any information please contact either the prince george rcmp at 250-561-3300 and the case number is 1989-28607 or contact crime stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS and you can leave an anonymous tip Well, we got more to talk about. We have a tip that came in about this case, which may give you some idea of what happened. And we have a lot of theories. As we've said before, when you have a case like this, where you have so little information, you end up with a lot of theories. So we're going to go through a lot of theories next time. And I don't know, not solve the case, unfortunately, but maybe at least, you know, we try and at least shed light on, on these things and how we think they went down. So we'll try and do that next time you want to answer questions alice yes yes i hope it's a something i'm so i'm glad we have these questions because i really feel like i feel very sad right now (laughs) it is good to end on a higher note than than we often do yes indeed yes let's answer some questions this is from true crime junkie 
What well, what is your favorite true crime podcast aside from your own, and why? Oh, that's hard. That's I know. hard. You know, I mean, we've talked about. I don't know. I mean, I'm always a big fan of Big Man True Crime with Heather Ashley, and Heather's awesome too. So it's always she nice is. to have somebody that you can enjoy listening to who is also awesome. So I'll count her as an example. Oh, she's fantastic. I mean, anything Heather does is gold. I tend to really like stories, like one season, basically not our format. <laughs> Because we never end. We're like 3,000 episodes in and people are like, what season are you on? Like season original? Yeah, it's uh, always like, season one here. Season one here. Like Bone Valley was just excellently done. You know, one season is one story. Gilbert King just does a, a great job. It's, you know, it's great arc. He also does a lot of investigating and interviewing of people himself. But I kind of like those snapshots. I don't like our version of going on forever. <laughs> Even though I talk forever. Yeah, and you know, True Crime Garage is one of my original loves. The Missing Maura Murray podcast. I mean, I was obsessed. When I discovered Missing Maura Murray, which is a surprise to no one, I was obsessed with that show. It's so crazy that we now know Tim and Lance. It's like a, I know. It's a weird feeling for me to like have <laughs> met them and shook their hands and stuff. It's wild. Yes, indeed. It's like the time that my phone rang and it was a number I didn't recognize. And I answered it and it was the captain. And I was like, well, I recognize that voice. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> so, you know, anyways, cool parts of doing a podcast. Okay, let's see. So that is one question. Let's and we're not even beginning one. to name all the people. We oh, have so many. So many. There's so all our friends do such a great job. And that's the thing. Making a podcast makes you really appreciate the work and time that people put into their podcasts. Because before I was just a consumer of podcasts and I was like, play, stop, whatever. Now I'm like, I don't want to stop because you put a lot of effort into this hour long episode. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, this is A A E R S. So I don't know if that's a word or what. But they say, I am 59 years old and have only been called to jury duty maybe three times. Is there any way to get your name back out there or is it truly random? Just curious. I am still in my 40s and I've only been called to jury duty one time. So I think I've it never just... been called. Really? Never? I, I don't know. Part of it is I think I've moved so much. So like in the last 15 years, I've lived in a dozen locations, like maybe not different cities, but different houses or apartments. And I think <laughs> they think I'm a nomad. <laughs> like yeah. I haven't lived in one jurisdiction long enough to ever be called up because I'm only in a jurisdiction for a year is my guess because I have no idea. I've never been held in contempt for not showing up. So it's not like I didn't show up, but there's no way to get yourself called more, except this is how it works. There's one pool, right? So if you register for voting, and you like have a, a a correct address on your driver's license, those are your best chances of getting called because they do have a lot of jury summons that go out, but they go to the wrong address because people don't update their driver's licenses. That's why there's the rules in all these local jurisdictions that say within 30 days or 60 days of moving, you have to change your address. It's because... Otherwise, they can't reach you. So if you are registered to vote and you have the correct address, that really is your best shot. And then if you don't get asked, if you don't kind of pull yourself out, because you can always write in with reasons not to be selected, like age or hardship, some sort of thing. They say they'll put you back into the pool and you're not supposed to be called for jury duty in some amount of time, like two years or whatever the jurisdiction's rules are if you just served on a jury. But we see people called all the time with like within the the span of time. So I think that is not real. I think that everyone's just always in the pool at all times and no one's taken out of the pool. I've been told that if you move to Washington DC and you live in DC and you register to vote, you have a really good chance of being called to jury duty because there's a lot of crime in Washington and not a lot of people who actually live in the city. So if you live in the city and you register to vote, and you're not a felon, you have a good chance of being jury duty. So if you just want to be a juror more than anything, you could move to Washington and roll the dice. And also there's so many lawyers that a lot of, you know, a lot of people want to strike lawyers from juries. But there were so many lawyers in D.C. because the 
government, federal government is there. A lot of, you know, federal agencies and law jobs are there that I knew a lot of lawyers who sat on juries and grand juries because they had no other choice. You can't strike every lawyer who comes in your panel because then you'd have no jurors. When I was in a law firm in D.C., that exact thing happened. It was like the one place you could be a lawyer and serve on a jury because they're just everybody's lawyer. You can't strike all the lawyers. So, yeah. So definitely if you're a lawyer and you want to serve on a jury, move to D.C. That's my recommendation to you. <laughs> all right, Alice. Well, we're going to be back next week with the rest of this story. It's a, it's a tragic one. It's a sad one. It's one I would like to believe wouldn't happen now. But I'm just going to live. I'm going to live with that fantasy that th this kind of story wouldn't happen now. And we'll be back with our theories in the case. If you want to reach out to us, prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Hello to everyone who is watching this live. All our patrons, you guys are awesome. And who get these episodes live early and ad free, even if they don't listen to it. So many perks. Join Patreon. Or don't. Watch us on YouTube instead. You can do that as well. Not early. Not ad-free. But a lot of fun too. We love you guys. Thank you so much for your support. If you want to recommend a case. I get questions about this all the time. If you want to recommend a case, the best way to do it is to send us an email. Prosecutorspod at gmail.com. That is the best way to do it. That way it gets on Madison's list. And it's much more likely that we will eventually do it. If you send it to me in a tweet or in an Instagram message or something else. I might remember to do it, but probably not. So email me. And feel free if in like a couple of years we haven't covered your case. Email me again. We have a long list. Alice, is there anything else you want to add before we sign off? No, except please come back because, you know, the theories, a lot of you are probably already thinking about theories for the Jack family case. And your theory is probably going to be as good as ours because this is a mind boggling case. And at bottom, I just want some justice to be done for them. And maybe if we get enough people to listen and someone who's in the area who knows something, someone says something, there can be justice, even if it looks not like the ultimate justice we'd like. Very well said, Alice. All right, guys, we'll be back next week. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. How could you pick such a terrible movie? I've yet again forgotten the name, but it was about ice sculpting. And the best, I think the, the really terrible part was like, they kept acting like ice sculpting was something that rich people do, and then everybody does it. <laughs> well, and, uh, okay, there were so many things to say about this movie. Number I one, know, it was like, it oh, should have when been Papa good. and I would sculpt. Yeah, it should have been good, number one. I know, it should have been It had good. all the elements. Number two, this weird thing, Thing they tried to shoehorn in that her mom didn't like her doing it when she'd been doing it with her dad. And it's not like mom and dad didn't get along. Right. You know? And her mom was perfectly nice, pleasant person. Like there was no yeah, indication was, her mom was She literally was, was like, let me take these depositions for you. Don't worry, baby. Yeah. <laughs> like, and she just graduated from law school. It's not like she's a jaded <sighs> lawyer. And when she leaves her law and, and the whole
Hold on to your jingle bells. Pluto TV has all your holiday favorites for free. Enjoy our season's greetings category with nine holiday channels, including holiday movie favorites by Lifetime, Festive Fireplace, Holiday Lights, and Hallmark Movies and more. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming holiday favorites on live channels and on demand with thousands of free movies and TV shows.